The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Don't worry, be happy. That's so often what we tell each other. But tonight, American writer Susan Cain explains why she thinks that's an incomplete prescription for a good life, which ought to also be able to appreciate the bittersweet. Then we'll revisit our conversation from earlier this year with Pulitzer Prize winning historian Anne Applebaum on what Russia's attack on Ukraine reminds us about autocracy. It's Monday, April 18th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. Americans famously love happiness so much, they even put the pursuit of it right in their Declaration of Independence. But for American writer Susan Cain, whose last book completely changed how the world saw introverts, happy is not quite all it's cracked up to be. In fact, as her new book points out, other less celebrated emotional states are essential to a good life. The new book is called Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. And Susan Cain joins us now from New York, New York. And it's great to have you on our program, Susan. How are you doing tonight? I am doing great. It's so good to be here, Steve. Thanks for having me. We are delighted to have you. We're going to start by just reading an excerpt of your book, and then we'll dive in after that uh, as we try to answer the question, what is bittersweet? Here we go. A tendency to states of longing, poignancy, and sorrow, an acute awareness of passing time, and a curiously piercing joy at the beauty of the world. The bittersweet is also about the recognition that light and dark, birth and death, bitter and sweet are forever paired. Days of honey, days of onion, as an Arabic proverb puts it. The tragedy of life is linked inescapably with its splendor. You could tear civilization down and rebuild it from scratch and the same dualities would rise again. Yet to fully inhabit these dualities, the dark as well as the light, is paradoxically the only way to transcend them. And transcending them is the ultimate point. The bittersweet is about the desire for communion, the wish to go home. That's beautifully written, if I may say so, just uh, off the top here. This does Thank feel, you. though, this does feel like a sadder time than most. Two years mm -hmm. of COVID-19, an awful war in Ukraine that is just disgusting. What, as you look at it, what's the difference between feeling melancholy, as you describe it here, and just out and out depression? They are different, and in our current culture and also in mainstream psychology, we lack a way to distinguish between the two of them. Um, clinical depression, as we know, is a kind of emotional black hole that saps you of the ability really to to live, to love yourself, to, to move forward. Melancholy can be a tremendously productive state in which you feel a sense of great connection to other people, to other beings. It can also be a real wellspring of creativity. Um, there, you know, Aristotle 2000 years ago asked this question of why it is, as in his observation, that the great poets of the time, politicians, philosophers, why so many of them had melancholic personalities. And that is a question that has been asked throughout the ages, really all the way up until the current age, where in our blinding quest for a monochrome happiness, we have lost sight of the full dimension of what it's like to be human. Well, that's it. We, we spend a great deal of our life trying to avoid this melancholy that you say we need so desperately. Do you find that bizarre? Do I find it bizarre that we try to ignore it? I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, you know, and there's many reasons for this. I, I, I trace them in the book, but kind of the, the, the short version, I guess, is that as we became in the 19th century, um, a culture that was so focused on business success. And, and in the 19th century, we kind of went through a series of booms and busts and booms and busts and, and people would lose all their money or fail to earn it in the first place. And, and this question started to come up of like, what, what was it that would make one person succeed and another person fail? And whereas in the past, we had answered that question by assuming that it was just the, the vagaries of misfortune, you know, just bad luck, um, or outside forces that were acting upon a person. Increasingly, the answer became that there was something inside the person that had caused their success or failure. 
And the more you start to believe that, and the more you think that, um, the more you want to avoid at all costs the attributes of somebody who looks like a, quote, loser. You know, and, and the word loser kind of kept uh, increasing in its use. It still is to this day. Um, so the more you want to avoid looking like a loser, the less you're going to talk about questions of loss, which are fundamental to the human experience, um, the less you're going to ever talk about sorrows, longings, that dimension. Um, you know, you, you'll you'll listen to music and and hear it that way, or see it in a piece of art, but you don't ever want to talk about it. And and that's that's a shame because we're we're all living sort of emotionally circumscribed existences as a result. Sure. Do do you do you see a particular personality type or types that are prone to melancholy or yearning? Well, uh, we do have in the quiz a, a bittersweet quiz. I'm sorry, we have in the book a bittersweet quiz that uh, I developed with two great psychologists, Scott Barry Kaufman and David Yadin, and. Um, and so, and, and the quiz measures how prone people are to these kinds of bittersweet experiences, where you're aware of happiness and sadness all at once. And we f we did find that people who are prone to these states also tend to be prone to experiences of awe, self transcendence, and spirituality, um, and also to score high on, a, on a, um, a psychological trait known as high sensitivity, which is a kind of a person who reacts intensely to both the positives and negatives of life. You know, somebody who reacts to the gorgeousness of a sunset and also to the, 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 the screeching sound of a construction site outside their window. Well, I, I did the quiz. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if it's possible to fail the quiz. I feel like I failed the quiz because, you know, like one of your questions, for example, is do you find comfort or inspiration in a rainy day? And I'm sorry, that's a zero for me. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, you know, have people ever described you as an old soul? And that's a 10 for me. So mm -hmm. I end up, you know, sort of a mediocre 5.4 at the end of the day, which is, I, I, I don't know. As you look at it, do you think more people... Do you lead a better life the higher number you score on the quiz? Because that's essentially what you're trying to get us to embrace, right? Our inner melancholy. Um, I am, but I don't believe, I, I believe there's many different pathways to a better life. And um, the quiz and the book is shining a light on one incredibly powerful pathway that has been undervalued in our culture. It's not to say that it's the only one. It's to say that it's an incredibly powerful one. Um, and uh, if it makes you feel better, <laughs> it was, I was doing a, an event the other day with my dear friend Angela Duckworth, um, you know, the author of the book Grit. And, and Angela is a very kind of upbeat, cheerfully optimistic person. Like, she's hilarious if you ever meet her. Um, and anyway, she said she did the she took the quiz and scored a zero. <laughs> so you're in good company. <laughs> Well, I did better than zero, but uh, <laughs> zero is a little harsh. There was the, I mean, the last question you ask is, well, actually, I want to put it to you here because uh, I'm not sure I completely understood it. And presumably it means different things to different people, which was, do you feel the ecstatic is close at hand? What do you interpret that to mean? Well, all human beings, one of the most fundamental aspects of being human is to come into this world with a sense of longing for a more perfect and beautiful world to which we feel we belong, you know, and there's a kind of gap between the world that we live in, the, the very imperfect, beautiful, beautifully imperfect one, let's say, that we live in and, and that world that we dream of. And we know that this is fundamental because it has been expressed in every religion, you know, whether you're looking at the Garden of Eden or Mecca or Zion, you know, the yearning for these states, for these places. Um, and we have secular expressions of it also. Uh, somewhere of, over the rainbow in the Wizard of Oz mm. is essentially the same human longing as that for the Garden of Eden. It's the same thing. There is a kind of a brush with the ecstatic that comes from being tuned, uh, being, being dialed into that state of longing. And we know this too from the mystical traditions of the great religions. Um, if you look at Suf Sufism, for example, which is the mystical uh, branch of Islam, uh, there's a long tradition there of understanding that the longing is what brings you to the sense of the divine, it's to the sense of belonging. And 
this is equally true for people who consider themselves atheists. You know, we, we have a kind of false dichotomy, I would say, in our culture between the secular uh, and the religious. And for those firmly on the secular side, that is causing us to lose sight of one of the great states of being alive. Well, you've just described the ecstatic in very deep and profound ways, but you are also, I'm going to bring this right down to brass tacks. You're also a Los sure. Angeles Rams football fan, and they won the <laughs> Super Bowl last year. So I wonder whether that got you a little closer to ecstatic than you had anticipated. <laughs> well, I will say if you had seen the, the scene in my in, in, in my family living room, because my, my husband and my boy, we're, we're all huge Rams fans. Um, that definitely looked like a lot of ecstasy all in one place. I, I mean, I, I, I totally feel that because, you know, for example, the Toronto Maple Leafs haven't won the Stanley Cup in 55 years, and they got a good team this year. Uh, I can guarantee you there are going to be two and a half million people in Toronto who are real close to ecstasy if and when that ever were to happen, God willing, in our lifetime at some point. But is that the... Now, that's... That's obviously, that's not the kind of profound, you know, in touch with God kind of ecstasy you're referring to in the book, but does it still count? It does still count. And I actually talk about this with my husband all the time because I'm, I'm much less of a sports person, but my husband and my, my two sons are like to the extreme. Um, and, and it was really my husband who first was pointing this, this out to me that the way that uh, sports fans feel, especially with team sports where it's a communal experience, you know, that, that there is this sense when the team wins where like you, you're all in a moment of collective transcendence where, you know, you, you've all transcended yourself and you've joined together into some kind of communion. Um, it, it, it's really very similar also to what people feel when they go to a musical concert that really moves them. Um, and, you know, you have that moment of, of just collective joy and collective union. Exactly. So, so yeah, we, we, we do have these brushes with that experience, you could say in our everyday lives, or you could say in these, um, actually, in moments where we step outside our everyday lives uh, to go to the sports arena or the concert hall or whatever it is. Well, we should talk about a great Canadian that you write about in your book. Do you know who I'm talking about here? Yeah, of course I do. I thought you I... might. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Leonard Cohen's your guy. How come? Oh, gosh. I, I Yes, I have loved him for decades. I actually dedicated uh, the book in his memory. And uh, and one of his quotations from his song Anthem is the epigraph to the book. And, um, you know, I, I for the, all those decades, I had loved him without exactly understanding why. But as I started researching the book and, and his life, I realized that he is the embodiment of a life philosophy that I hold very dear and I'm trying to express in the book. Um, it, it comes out especially in the epigraph that I used, which is um, there's a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. Mm. And, um, and, and I learned that he derived much of that philosophy from the Kabbalah, which is the mystical version of Judaism. And like one of the central metaphors in the Kabbalah is the idea that all of creation was at first an intact vessel, a divine vessel, which then shattered, and that the world we're living in now is a beautiful world, but also a broken world with these shards from that vessel scattered all around us. And that the the way to live amidst that brokenness is to try to you know, pick up those beautiful shards of light wherever you can find them. And again, I, I believe this kind of metaphor is incredibly, um, it's an incredible lodestone, even for someone who considers themselves a complete atheist. That's not, uh, there, there, there's a powerful truth in that, mm -hmm. um, that can help us, especially in moments like this, where, you know, as, as you said, when we started, we're living through the pandemic and the war in Ukraine and all of it. Um, but to remember that there are these cracks where the light gets in, uh, is very, uh, very useful. Indeed. And uh, I want to pick up on that if I can here because, and we'll stay with music here, I think many people will well remember, and we're going back, I guess, about 30 years now in Sarajevo, where there was a cellist who sort of, mm -hmm. amidst all of the bombing, was just playing this gorgeous music. Uh, and we see the same thing now in Ukraine, uh, where there was a pianist named Karina Manukina playing Chopin in the ruins of her house near Kiev. 
and uh, the house having been damaged by Russian shelling. We've got a clip of that. I just want to play some of that, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would, mm -hmm. the clip. I mean, you want to talk profoundly magnificent. There it is right there. What impulse do you think is being exercised there to play music, to play beautiful music amidst complete chaos and ruin? It is the instinct to want to transcend um, the chaos, the sorrow, the brokenness that, I mean, it was literally all around her in that beautiful clip. I mean, literally everything is broken around her. Um, but there's a sense in which that kind of music and the what what art really can be at its best, and this is true not only for great art, but also for, you know, like a kindergarten kid scribbling a picture um, or for the cake that, <laughs> that, you, that you baked last night. What, what art can really be at its best is the human impulse to transform pain into beauty. And this is why we love sad songs the way that we do, because there's something in them where you're sensing the musician's willful desire to say, I'm faced with pain and I can do two different things with it. You know, I can descend into it and I can take it out on myself or the people around me, or I can try to turn it into something um, that is the best of human experience and into an expression of love. And that's what... That's what she was doing in that gorgeous clip. Well, you've got the numbers in your book. You say people tend to play on their playlists, on their smartphones, uh, 170 times the happy songs and 800 times the sad songs. I mean, that's not even close. What does that say about us? Right. Yeah. For people who where their favorite song is sad music, they will play it 800 times. <laughs> what it says is there's something about that kind of music that explains us to ourselves and explains ourselves to each other. Um, what people who listen to that kind of music also tell researchers that when they hear it, they feel connected to awe and to wonder um, and to a sense of something greater than themselves. So it's what researchers call the sublime emotions. So that encapsulates almost better than anything else why it is such an impo an emotional impoverishment to live in a culture that tells you not to go there because these are some of the highest states of being human um, and we have all these different mechanisms that we've developed over the centuries to get us there to get us to that state and we should be using it more often it's one of the great ways we have to connect well, I'm sorry to raise this now, but you do talk about it in the book, and this is hardly an academic discussion for you because you experienced, mm -hmm. you have experienced uh, over the last little while, uh, deep and significant loss in your life, the loss of a sibling, mm -hmm. the loss of a parent. And I, I wonder how hard it was for you, given the book that you have written, to keep in your mind the notion that the sorrow that you were definitely experiencing related to those deaths could somehow be constructive at the end of the day. How tough was that for you? Um, yeah, I lost my father and my brother to COVID. So that was happening kind of during the second half of writing the book. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a way in which having been immersed in this topic probably made it a little bit easier to bear because I was so attuned to the fact of the impermanence of life and the fact that everybody goes through these kinds of losses and bereavements. But I also want to say that, you know, especially for anybody who's listening, who is going through mourning themselves like that, I, 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 I wouldn't want the takeaway to be, you know, whatever grief you're feeling, the sorrow you're feeling, like, immediately turn it into something constructive that like that, that would be an almost cruelly positive message really mm -hmm. um I, in some ways the message is more just to understand that you're not alone in it and quite the contrary this has always been the human experience and, and i actually found that to be incredibly um comforting that in and of itself you know you're like 
you're part of a greater communion and the sorrow you feel is the sorrow not to take that away um but to but to kind of draw on the fact of this is what life is as opposed to this is a terrible detour from what life is supposed to be Hmm. um you, you stop resisting it so much i think when you accept it in those terms it's uh, sure yes however i mean covid-19 uh that's just nothing that anybody i'm sure two, more than 2 years ago you did not anticipate experiencing that much loss because of the global pandemic in such a short space of time and i wonder if you have to actually say to yourself while you're mourning this sorrow that i am experiencing right now uh i know what it is and I understand it, I hate it, but I get it, and it will lead me ultimately to a better place. I don't know. Do you, do you, do you, make those, do you have those conversations with yourself? So there's a, a poem that I talk about in the book. It was written 200 years ago by one of Japan's great poets. He wrote it after losing his daughter to smallpox. And I do believe losing a child is probably one of the greatest losses humans can ever face. And this poet, he was a Buddhist, so he was extremely deeply aware and schooled in the impermanence of life. And the poem that he wrote was basically a protest against that. You know, he, in, in the gentlest way, he wrote, I understand that a dewdrop is just a dewdrop, you know, meaning I understand that life is impermanent, hmm. but even so, but even so. And and I think that that's what we all feel at the end of the day. Like, yes, I get it. I, I get it that life is impermanent. I get it that I'm connected to everybody in this. But even so, I want my daughter back, right? Right. Um, and and accepting that that too is that's that's what grief is. Hmm. A bit of an odd question here for for an author, but uh, let's try this anyway. Given what you experienced while you were writing the book, did you feel the book came more easily, the, the actual writing of it sort of came out of your fingertips more easily because of what you were actually experiencing while writing it? Um, honestly, no. I have been deeply aware of all of these currents of the human experience for my whole life. Um, you know, I've always thought of myself as a kind of happy melancholic. Um, you know, we, we started by talking about that distinction between depression and melancholy. So I've been lucky not to face depression, but I do have a kind of melancholic temperament. So yeah, I, I, I would say that, um, the book came just as easily the whole way through, you know, it was a real labor of love for me because it was, it was something I really wanted to express and I knew that other people wanted to hear. Um, and in fact, it actually has been an interesting thing in that I never thought of this book as being a companion in any way to quiet my first book. Like they're quite different in a lot of ways, but the thing they both have in common is that the reactions I'm getting to bittersweet are identical to quiet and that people are saying, oh, you know, finally I have a sense of permission to be who I am and feel the way I do and experience that which I experience, um, you know, a, a sense of validation and a sense of permission. So I think that that was coming from a deep place that was with me from the moment I first started. I totally get that because you do talk about a, quote, tyranny of positivity that so many people uh, experience nowadays. How do we get out of that? Well, unfortunately, I think we're being yanked out of it by external events. Um, it becomes almost obscene to be uh, willful, to be like forcefully positive, let's say, um, in the face of actual problems, sorrows surrounding us. Um, but in terms of like concrete things that people can do in their everyday lives, there's a lot of them. Um, one would be 
like in the workplace, for example, to simply normalize these kinds of discussions. You know, I, I, I give a lot of virtual talks and, and at the beginning of the talks, very often the organizer will open by asking everybody to say how they feel in the chat box. And the chat box instantly fills up with like a whole <clears throat> collection of positive emotions. <clears throat> Excuse me, like everybody's feeling wonderful and great and thrilled <laughs> to be here. And and I'm sure some people really are, and that's wonderful. But I'm sure some people aren't, and they don't feel like they can say so. So for leaders to go first um, and let people know what they're truly feeling and that they're still getting things done and those two things can coexist goes a long way. Um, there's also a practice called expressive writing that was discovered by a great psychologist named James Bene James Pennebaker at University of Texas. And he found that the simple act of writing down troubles or like the things that are bothering you, it could just be a couple of minutes at the beginning of the day where you scribble it down and throw it away after that. That simple act lowers people's blood pressure, makes them more successful at work, um, gives them a greater sense of well-being. He had one study where he took a group of engineers who had been laid off. They were in their 50s and they were pretty depressed about this and couldn't find work. And he asked half of them to write down what they were wearing every morning and the other half to write down how they were feeling and their troubles. And that that second half who had written down what they truly felt were significantly more likely to have found work a few months later and their health markers improved too. It, it, it's kind of astonishing. Um, but the simple act of, of telling the truth about what it what you feel and what it is to be alive is incredibly liberating. Well, that is one thing this book does is that it does give you permission to 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 embrace your inner melancholy. But for those people, and uh, okay, confession time here. I think I'm one of them. For those people who are yeah. glass half full people, yeah. Um, what is there a message that they can take out of this book that you think uh, resonates just as much? Yes, I mean, it, even if you're a glass half full person, and I'm married to a glass half full person, so I know. It's annoying, isn't I know it? Your way of no, I love <laughs> it. I, I actually think we complement each other really well. Um, so, but even into your life will come various troubles because that's mm. the nature of being alive. So to kind of accept it and go with it, um, and also find the connection in it and realizing that. It, it, the same thing is true for every other human. Um, and this is one of the ways that we bond with each other. We actually know this from uh, uh, evolutionary evolutionary studies. So uh, it, 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 it can be a very helpful way of understanding how to deal with loss, which for somebody like you might actually in some ways come as more of a shock and a surprise because you're not as likely to be oriented that way or thinking about it in the first place. Yep. And it, it, it could catch you blindside when it comes. Fair point. Uh, last question for you. What's your favorite sad song? Oh, <laughs> like Leonard Cohen's whole library, let's say. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can go with Anthem, uh, you know, the, the song with which I dedicated the book. But there are so many of them. Super. Uh, it's a wonderful book, and uh, I'm so glad you wrote it. And it was a great read. Susan Cain, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. So nice of you to join us on TVO tonight, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Tomorrow on the agenda. Reframing ambition doesn't mean that I don't work hard and that I don't still value work. It just means that it, it's not going to take over my life in the way that it has. And I, of course, I worry. I mean, I'm, I'm a woman and I read a stat that said women reach their peak earning years, um, you know, in their early to mid 40s. That's not far off from me. And the idea that this mm. is the most that I'll be making after everything that I've put into building my career is is very concerning and gives me a lot of anxiety. That's tomorrow on the agenda. Between Ukraine's historic defiance and Russia's brutal insistence on war, the rest of the world is struggling to understand what is underway and where it leads. To date, all attempts at mediation have failed. Anne Applebaum is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian and staff writer for The Atlantic, who's written several books on Russia, Ukraine and Eastern Europe in the 20th century. Her most recent book is Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. And she joins us now from Washington, D.C. And Anne, we are delighted to have you. 
back on TVO here. How are you managing these days? I'm, I'm fine. I'm a little overwhelmed, but I'm fine. Thank you. I understand why you and so many others are overwhelmed at the state of the world these days. I want to start by reading something that you wrote earlier this year, and then we'll come out of this and chat. You did write, in fact, the best time to give Ukraine more significant military support would have been eight years ago, or five years ago, or three years ago. If the U.S. had done so, then there would be a lesser threat or no threat of Russian invasion now because Putin would calculate the risks differently. But Americans didn't step in because President Barack Obama never took Russia seriously, because Trump was on Putin's side in the global contest between autocracy and democracy, and because Democrats and Republicans alike have had other things to think about since Biden took office. Now, time has passed a few months since you wrote that, and I'm wondering whether you regard it at all differently. Might things be different now had Washington taken different decisions over the past many years? Yes, I do believe things might be different now if Washington had taken dis different decisions, and not only in Ukraine. Um, our failure to react when Russia annexed Crimea, at least to react with sufficient, um, with sufficient force, uh, our failure to react in the years earlier when Russia invaded Georgia, our failure to react when Russia murdered um, murdered people in, in Berlin and London and Salisbury, uh, you know, used poisonous chemicals to attack people in the street. Um, our failure in general to take Russia seriously and to listen carefully to what Putin was saying and to understand what kind of state he was building and what his goals were, which he's been very clear about for many years, all of that I, I regret enormously. Um, I, I feel that the, he made a judgment that the West would not defend Ukraine, um, that he would not be severely sanctioned for invading Ukraine, and that he would somehow get away with it. He would reincorporate Ukraine into Russia, and, and the world would move on. Uh, had he not made that calculation, had he been more afraid either of a military response or of a different kind of economic um, response or response in other spheres, he might have acted differently. Putin clearly miscalculated this time, but I'm wondering what what do you think was underpinning the West's lack of response to every other moment in history when it could have done more over the past many years? I think that the West became complacent after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, we told ourselves that we had created this thing called the liberal world order, that there were rules and norms, that there were institutions to manage conflict, uh, that that you know, no, nobody would break those rules because there was no reason to break them because everybody understood them and abided by them. Um, we convinced ourselves that this, these rules applied to everybody and not just to Europe and the United States and Canada. Uh, and I think we failed to see that the rise in autocracy in Russia and in other countries meant that a, a new breed of leader was coming to power who did not respect these rules and who began to see that really they weren't enforced. Um, actually, the invasion of Crimea did not win you some kind of special sanction. You were not excluded from the Club of Nations. You were not able, you didn't have to stop trading. You could, you could carry on. Um, they, and, and yet we, we made this, we didn't see that. We didn't acknowledge it. We were too confident uh, that our own values were everybody's values. I think it was the, you know, the universalism of the West is one of the most attractive things about it. Um, the thing that we, we believe that human rights are for everybody and democracy is for everybody. Um, but we sometimes make the mistake of taking that a step farther and assuming that everybody already believes that too. Um, you know, we, we want people to be able to have these things. We think everybody can, but that doesn't mean that the leader of every country uh, is so convinced. And why do you think, having turned a blind eye, if you like, to all of those moments in history you just enumerated, what is it about the invasion of Ukraine that was clearly a bridge too far for the West this time? I think the 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 unprovoked nature of the invasion that for, from certainly from our point of view, there's no rational explanation for it. Um, I think the bravery of the Ukrainians uh, and of their president has impressed on people the fact that this is a nation that wants to protect its sovereignty and cares about it. Um, I really think we might be looking at a different kind of story had had that not been the case. Um, but particularly in the Western world where people are, and you know, particularly in Europe, where people are sensitive to the lessons of history, the sight of, an, of a smaller country fighting for democracy and freedom and sovereignty against a larger dictatorship 
brings back a lot of memories and makes reminds people of the Second World War. Even the photographs out of Ukraine, you know, if you make them black and white, you know, they could be 1939, you know, or 1941. Um, and they, they, they evoke some uh, memories, you know, in people. And I think the, there's something particular about the Ukrainian cause. You know, in the West, we've been fighting kind of culture war for the last decade between liberalism on the one hand and some kind of nationalism on the other. And the Ukrainians are showing us something different. You know, this is a, a kind of muscular, patriotic defense of a liberal, open society. Um, and I think that has a really strong bipartisan appeal, not only in the United States, but in 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 the other democracies. Um, we, we, we instinctively understand it in a way that other wars, civil wars, um, have been much harder to understand. Now, pretty clearly, the last three weeks have not gone according to Putin's playbook. Um, you, you know, no one can know what's going on inside his head, but methinks he probably thought this would be over after a few days, and here we are a few weeks later, and the Ukrainians are simply not cooperating with him in the way they want. Why do you think it's gone so badly for Russia so far? Well, first, I should say that it's not a guess that Putin thought it would be over quickly. We know he thought it would be over quickly. Um, he, the, you know, a, a couple of days after the invasion, an article that was meant to appear in several Russian websites and, and online publications accidentally appeared in one or two of them. And the article was a kind of triumphant description. Now we are in Kiev. Now a new epoch has begun. Now we will reunite Russia and Ukraine and Belarus. And we enter a new era of Russia and its relationships with Europe and so on and so on. So we know they thought it was going to be fast because that's what they were planning for. And that's what they said. And that's what the that's what their propaganda said, um, even if it proved to be incorrect. Um, I think, you know, P Putin is almost... I mean, if you want a lesson in why autocracy is a worse political system than democracy, the isolation of Putin, the fact that he's surrounded by only by people who agree with him, um, the fact that he had so little knowledge of Ukraine and so little contact with Ukrainians um, meant that he underestimated how much they were going to resist and how much they were going to fight back. Um, he may also have understood less about his own army than you know, than, than you would expect. I mean, it's, you know, there, there are a lot of stories now coming out about corruption in the Russian army. Um, generals were lying about how many men they had at the front. Uh, they said they weren't using conscripts, but in fact they were. Um, they may not have been maintaining their vehicles the way they were supposed to do. So there, were, there were a lot of things that were not told to Putin or not conveyed to him um, because he was not interested in hearing bad news. Um, and he, you know, he, he, he himself is untransparent and he's surrounded by untransparent institutions. It's not clear who has any influence over him, who has a formal relationship with him. Um, and he made the mistake um, of guessing wrong. Well, in fact, we've got some other examples here of some curious decision making. For example, he's asked China to help out militarily for some equipment. He apparently has uh, looked to Syria and Libya for mercenaries to help. Uh, there are suggestions that eight generals have been removed from their positions, two senior FSB intelligence officers arrested. How much of this how much of this do you think we can take at face value and how much of it is the fog of war? Some of it is the fog of war. Um, I mean, we don't really know, you know, whereas we do know, by the way, what Putin says about himself and his goals, which are very clear. We don't know that much about what he really says to China. And it isn't clear to me yet that this Syrian part of the story is anything more than propaganda. Um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see in the, in the coming days. I mean, we do know that he's brought Chechens into the conflict. Um, but we, you know, I, I just don't know what kind of numbers we're talking about coming from Syria. So some of it, some of it is that, and some of it may reflect a real attempt to do a, you know, a reset in the middle of the war um, to, you know, start again to use some different allies, um, to, you know, to change tactics. I mean, it seems to me the most important change in tactics um, and the most um, horrible and brutal aspect of this war is the fact that they've reverted to almost as one Ukrainian soldier described it, I mean, it's almost World War II style tactics. They've, they've reverted to mass and indiscriminate bombing of civilians. And so they're hitting apartment blocks, kindergartens, hospitals. They may even be hitting hospitals on purpose, which we know they did in Syria. Um, and it seems to be, a, there's a deliberate attempt to demoralize the population you know, in the most brutal way possible. Uh, and that's been, you know, shifting to those tactics. You know, this is not a surgical strike. It wasn't a blitzkrieg. Instead, we have this attempt to just wear down the Ukrainians, which is 
extraordinarily ugly and as I say reminiscent of really the worst um, the worst pages of past European history. There was a tweet the other day from someone named Kamil Galiev, which has been gaining some currency and I'll just read this to you and get you to react to it. He wrote, a czar absolutely can rule while being hated, but he can't rule without being respected. And a shameful defeat destroys any respect. Do you suspect that we are any closer to uh, a, a locally organized conspiracy to get rid of Putin? So I'm afraid I think some of that is wishful thinking on our part. Um, there is no mechanism to change the leader of Russia. And not only that, even if there were such a mechanism, we don't know how the next leader would be chosen or who would choose it. You know, at least in the Soviet era, there was a Politburo. So there was a, there were some intermediate institutions. There were other means of, of talking to Moscow. There were you know, back channels and all kinds of um, special ways we could get in touch with people other than, the, other than the leader. We don't really have that now. And because of that, we don't have really all that much knowledge of Putin's inner circle. Um, we know that he spent a lot of the last two years in some kind of COVID bunker, um, that he made people spend two weeks in quarantine before even coming in to see him. Um, and we don't know even how often he speaks to his generals or to his FSB colonels. Um, so, so it's a, um, you know, we, we are operating in a vacuum. And there, you know, it has to be said that there's no tradition in Russia of a military coup. Um, it's not something that you see a lot of in Russian history. Um, you know, the, the one precedent people sometimes talk about is the arrest of Beria, who was Stalin's secret police chief after he died. And that was really done by getting him into a room with the rest of the Politburo and then having him arrested and taken away. But that seems that method seems difficult in these circumstances where um, there isn't a Politburo to get to, to be in the room with. So so although I know it sounds like a nice way to end the war or a, not nice, but a that was the wrong word, but a but a, a kind of convenient way for us to end the war. I I don't have any evidence right now that it will happen. How about this? If memory serves, th there was a kind of a um, well, it was a direct line, like a, a red phone between uh, the Kremlin and the White House at the height of the Cold War, to ensure that there could be direct communication if things got to DEFCON one. Do you know whether or not such a line exists today? I'm sure such a line exists today. I just think that the all the protocols and the rules around those kinds of communications um, have really fallen away. I remember the last proxy war that we fought with, with, with the Soviet Union was, I think it was Afghanistan in the 1980s, which was a completely different kind of conflict with no nuclear overtones and no existential threat to anybody. Um, and all we were doing in that war was giving some stingers, actually, some sophisticated weapons to, um, you know, to, to, to Afghan tribal leaders. Uh, so it was a completely different kind of war. Um, and and there, again, there used to be these, you know, ways of talking and those, you know, you're allowed to do X, but not Y. You can use this weapon, but that weapon would be escalatory. All that is gone. And we're now really operating in the dark. There are no rules and we don't really know what Putin would consider to be escalatory um, and what would not be. Hmm. And there has been a tendency to say that this is Vladimir Putin's war. And if only Putin were out of the way, things would be different. Do you believe that? I mean, to the extent that Putin is now a kind of isolated leader, yes, of course they would be different if he was not in charge. I do think that. But it's also wrong to imagine that this is just Putin's war. So Putin would not be able to carry out this war if he did not have the support of hundreds of thousands or even millions of Russians. And I don't just mean you know the sort of propagandists you see on TV, but I mean the people who work in the in the um, you know in the so-called power ministries, in the army, in the secret police, um, you know the people who who support him unthinkingly. I mean, there's a there are layers and layers of people around him who who at least say they support what they what he's doing, or at least too afraid to say that they're not. So this is not a this is not an action that could be carried out by one person. Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, and his suggestion that this whole thing could go away if essentially somebody, quote unquote, took him out. What did you think of that? It's a bit silly. I mean, it's just wishful thinking. Um, and, you know, there's really no evidence, A, that it can happen or B, that that would be the result. And uh, again, I don't know how much we sh how much stock to put in this polling, but 
The Russian Public Opinion Research Center did just publish a poll saying that since the war began, Putin's personal approval rating in Russia has gone from 64 to 74 and a half percent. Do you put stock in that? No, uh, no, I really don't. I mean, I don't think there's much polling in Russia that's very valuable. I mean, imagine, you know, you're a taxi driver in Krasnoyarsk and somebody calls up and said, hello, I'm a polling company from Moscow. Do you support the president? Or what are you going to say? You're going to say, yes, Russia's a police state. Um, people would be afraid to answer in any other way. Um, there was some polling that was a little bit better done by the Navalny organization. This is the organization run by Alexei Navalny, who's currently in prison, um, but who's whose organization was the best organized um, and most effective opposition movement in Russia in many years. Um, m most of its members have now left the country, but um, they did conduct a poll using an online technique they've used before. And that showed, this was in the first couple of weeks of the war, um, that showed that as some news about the war was creeping in, disapproval of it was going up. Hmm. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't remarkable numbers, but the direction was disapproval going up. Um, and, you know, much depends on what happens and what Russians see and what they understand is happening. I mean, as we know, there's a kind of complete propaganda blackout there right now, and people are only told that any, any, any destruction that you see is the Ukrainians' fault. The Russians are only aiming to hit military targets. Um, you know, they're, 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 people are being given a completely different version of the war. And although some people can find an alternative, you know, you know if you have a VPN and you know how to look online, most people are now cut off from any sources of information that would show them something different. Let me ask you directly about the Ukrainians themselves. And that is, is there something, and you know, you've written so many good books about Ukraine's history, and I, is there something in Ukraine's history that would explain the astonishing bravery against all odds that Ukrainians have shown thus far? Yes. Um, the Ukrainians have a memory of being assaulted by genocidal language and mass violence, um, and, and more than once. Um, the, 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 the piece of their history that I wrote about, I wrote a book called Red Famine, um, that was a description of the Ukrainian famine of 1932 and 1933, which was the cumulated effect of Stalin's paranoia about the Ukrainians. Interestingly, it has some parallels with Putin's paranoia about the Ukrainians. He thought of them as a kind of existential threat to power in Moscow. Um, and he organized an artificial famine. Food was taken away from Ukrainians and um, confiscated. So this wasn't anything to do with the weather or insects or, or anything like that. Um, and very close to 4 million people died. Uh, then in the wake of that event, there was a an attack on the entire Ukrainian intelligentsia and leadership. So writers, artists, poets, museum curators, university professors, even the Ukrainian Communist Party um, was decimated. So so the memory of, of mass violence and the understanding of what it's like and the knowledge that it could be directed at them again is what's motivating people. And I, I should say that to my utter horror and to the horror of anybody who knows the history of this region, what the Russians are doing in the few towns that they have managed to occupy looks a lot like what the Red Army did when it occupied new territories in the 20th century. Hmm. So we're hearing reports of mass violence, um, the arrest of you know mayors of towns, um, people being you know killed for no reason, um, people, cars being shot at, um, the use of mass violence and terror in order to terrorize the population, to remove its leadership, um, and to subjugate it, this is something that we've seen in that part of the world over and over again. And it is a horrifying, horrifying piece of history to be forced to repeat. You know, if we were having this conversation many, many decades ago, uh, my next question about Ukrainian nationalism might have been answered by you differently than I suspect the answer you will give now. How has it changed over the intervening decades? So you, the important thing to understand about modern Ukrainian nationalism as it's embodied in the current state and the, and the current leadership um, is that although I don't think anybody ever uses this language in Ukraine, um, it's a kind of civic nationalism as opposed to an ethnic nationalism. And so what Zelensky represents, the, the president of Ukraine, who, who is, of course, Jewish, um, he represents an idea of Ukrainian-ness that can encompass both Russian and Ukrainian speakers. He himself is a native Russian speaker, and he's from a part of Ukraine that is mostly Russian speaking. Um, it can include Jews. It can include people of other faiths. 
Um, anybody can be Ukrainian as long as they are loyal to the nation. And in, in this case, the modern definition of that means that you believe in Ukrainian democracy and you believe in Ukrainian integration with the West. So the idea of the nation has become bound up with that, bound up with the idea of democracy and bound up with the idea that we are not Russia. Not, not that we are not Russia in an ethnic sense, but that we are not an autocracy. We don't want kleptocracy. We want to maintain some greater freedom of speech. Um, we want to be able to trade with who we want to trade with. And we will also, of course, we want our sovereignty. And if you believe in those things, then you're Ukrainian. Um, and and that so that that's a wider definition of nationalism than one you might have found really anywhere in that part of the world 30 or 40 years ago. I get asked this question all the time, so I'm going to put it to you because I saw the other day in one of Tom Friedman's columns in the New York Times that he talked about a dirty compromise, quote unquote, how Putin saves face uh, how to deal with the nuclear blackmail, and it essentially means accepting Russian rule in Crimea and in the eastern provinces of Ukraine, insisting, agreeing, consenting that Ukraine can never join NATO, and the U.S. and its allies agreeing to lift all the sanctions that are currently imposed on Russia. Do you see that as a way out of this? I mean, there are a number of agreements that I can imagine people coming to as a way to end this conflict. But they are all have to be predicated on a Ukrainian victory. In other words, the Russians have to withdraw their troops. They have to end the war. Um, and they have to pull them away, and they have to stop fighting. And I don't think there's going to be any real negotiation until that happens. I mean, this was this is this is not a civil war. This was not a conflict that had a, you know, where both sides are somehow responsible. Um, this is a this was a brutal attack by Russia, and I don't think the Ukrainians are going to negotiate until the Russians are out. Um, and at that point, there may be there may be things they can agree to. I mean, the one point about I mean, NATO is a kind of red herring. I think. I mean, I don't think the Ukrainians can ever agree to be neutral in the sense of having no weapons or having no army. I mean, this will be a country that I mean, as long as there is Putin is the leader or somebody like Putin is the leader of Russia then Ukraine will always feel itself to be under threat and it will remain a heavily armed country with a with a you know large and powerful military and so i don't think that's going to ever be negotiated away let me get your take on this idea that was sort of in the air for a while and that was to transfer the mig 29s that poland had to ukraine and that nato would therefore replace those planes with i don't know what f35s or something like that uh, it looked like that might happen for a bit, and then it sort of got scuttled. Uh, what do you think of that as a potential idea? I mean, I don't, from what I understand, and this is not my area of expertise, but from what I understand, the MiGs would not make a huge difference to the war effort, um, that it would not be the thing that the Ukrainians really need, which is, you know, closing the skies or having some way of stopping the, um, the cruise missiles and the bombing campaigns. Um, and so, although they would be, they would offer a morale boost, and there are of course other things you can do with MIGs. Then that would be, you know, they could use them to, sh you know, sh sh shoot down um, Russian planes. Um, I, I understood that they're not really a game changer, that, but the, although there are a number of things here, I, mean, I don't really understand what's the difference between giving Ukraine MIGs and giving Ukraine javelins, and how come we can do the latter and not the former? That doesn't really make sense to me. It seems like what happened was that. It was a combination of the Pentagon not liking the optics of the planes taking off from a U.S. air base in Germany. Um, you know, that looked too much like U.S. engagement in the war. And possibly the Polish government, which um, f fired many of its competent diplomats, um, making a mistake or misunderstanding something. So I I'm not sure that it's that significant an issue. I mean, what really matters now is what kinds of weapons we are willing to give them. And are those going to be the ones that can help them win the war? I, I, what I'm, what what worries me is that not enough people in Washington and maybe in Ottawa and London and Berlin and Paris, not enough people are thinking about how to win. It's very important that Ukraine wins, and that means that they expel the Russians from um, from the, the the towns that they occupy. Because um, without that win, without that some kind of victory, you know, we can disguise it as something else if it helps Russia leave and helps Putin, um, you know, walk out. Um, but without that, I think it's hard to imagine how there's really any long lasting peace. Hmm. We're down to our last 30 seconds here, Anne, and I simply want to ask you, what in your judgment has been the most impressive thing from the Ukrainian side during this war? 
I think Zelensky's speeches um, made with a, you know, with a handheld video camera uh, late at night from his office in which he speaks like a normal person talking to friends. Um, and he really trans gives people this sense of security and optimism. I think that has been the most remarkable thing about the war so far. Well, he has the background to do that, doesn't he? He does. Um, he he was a talented actor, although he was a different kind of actor. He was a comedian <laughs> and not a not a um, you know not a great orator. Apparently, those skills are transferable. And we want to thank you so much for joining us for so much time here on TVO tonight. We are happy to remind people that your latest is called Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. And we're glad that uh, it's been able to bring you to our program tonight. Be well. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Monday, April 18th, 2022. Tomorrow, we'll find out about what's called hustle culture and why the pandemic has led people to reconsider the constant churn to make ends meet. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.